As we get started this morning, I'd like to ask you, if you will, to turn in your Bibles to the part, place in Scripture where the Lord commands us to inhale and exhale several times every minute to make sure that our heart continues beating. Let's, let's go ahead and turn to that passage. Aaron, why are you not flipping your pages? You are not moving your Bible at all. Are you telling me it's not in there? We don't, we don't find it in Scripture, do we? Um, let's turn in our Bibles and read the passages where the Lord commands us that when he offers us forgiveness and mercy that we need to take it. Hunter, you're not, you're not moving your Bible. Okay, now you're just randomly flipping it back and forth there. The point is, and I think you know the point, the Holy Spirit, when he was inspiring these men to write what we have from God, did not waste any time commanding us to do things or not do things that come naturally to us. I mean, as soon as we come into the world as a newborn baby, and the doctor gives us that smack on the back of whatever they do nowadays, we know how to breathe in and out. So the Lord doesn't have to spend any time in Scripture giving us instructions about things that come naturally. Um, he doesn't have to tell us that when he offers us forgiveness and mercy, he does not have to command us that when I offer this, when I'm giving this to you, you take it. He gives a lot of commands in Scripture about being merciful to others. He gives us lots of commands in Scripture to offer forgiveness to others. Because being merciful, offering forgiveness, does not come near as naturally to us as being on the receiving end. And so as we read through Scripture and we come across instructions, we come across commands for things that we should do, and we come across commands that are telling us not to do certain things, the reason why they're put there is because they're not things that necessarily come naturally. And in many cases, in most cases, maybe in about all of the cases, the reason why it's put there is because our tendency is not to do the thing that God is commanding us to do or to do the thing that God is commanding us not to do. And it's interesting in the Sermon on the Mount that the longest recorded sermon that the Lord preached while in the flesh that we have um, recorded for us in Scripture, right smack in the middle of that lesson, the Lord spends almost 10% of the entire content of this sermon. Once you kind of look at how much time he spends on this topic, and you realize all the things that, that he may have said that, uh, were not recorded, um, all of the things that he could have talked about that maybe he chose not to address on this particular occasion, knowing that he was preaching a sermon that was not just for the benefit of that multitude, but for the benefit of all human beings that would come in contact with that sermon from that point to the end of time. And right smack in the middle, he spends close to 10% of the recorded content of that lesson under the sub topic, do not worry. Why? Why did the Lord spend so much time in a lesson of that magnitude on this one particular topic? Well, I think we all know the answer, don't we? For many of us, our tendency is to do the opposite. For many of us, our tendency is to worry. Our tendency is to overly obsess over the what ifs or the what may be's or maybe even the what has happened. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul, in writing to the Philippian church, says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So, why does Paul Pauls in this inspired letter, being moved by the Holy Spirit to tell these first century Christians not to be anxious. Why? 
Well, again, when we come across a command, when we're told to do something or we're told not to do something, we're learning something about human nature because our tendency is to do the opposite. Our inclination at times, for many of us, for most of us, at times is to do the opposite. And so he tells us to be anxious for nothing because it may be that many of us, our tendency is to be anxious about everything or maybe about many things. Peter in his first epistle, 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. He's telling us this is an instruction uh, that we need to heed, that we need to incorporate in our life, and especially in light of what he says right after that, to be sober, to be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion is ro uh, roaming about seeking whom he may devour. And so the devil is trying to inflict care and concern and anxiety and worry and problems into our life. So in order to combat those, in order to deal with those, in order to be prepared for those when they come, cast all your care upon him. Why does Peter have to remind us to do that? Why does he have to tell us to do that? Because for many of us, maybe for most of us, that care and that thing that is, that is causing us burden and concern, we just want to hold on to it a little while longer we want to try to deal with it ourselves a little while longer we want to try to roll it over in our mind a little while longer so the tendency may be to do the opposite of what we're being commanded to do the Lord in one of the last conversations recorded conversations at least that we have in scripture before his betrayal in his arrest and his death on the cross for our sins. It's recorded for us in John chapters 14 through 16. In chapter 14 and verse 27, the Lord says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. And so Jesus is instructing his apostles to have this mentality, to not let their hearts be troubled, to not let their hearts be afraid. Why? The Lord knows their future. And he knows that they're going to have ample opportunity in the days and the months and the years that are to come to be troubled, to be afraid, to be worried, to, to be overwhelmed by anxiety. And so he's telling them, I, I know what your inclination is going to be. I know what you're going to be tempted to do. I know what the tendency is going to be for you in certain, circum certain circumstances, but I'm challenging you, I'm commanding you to keep your peace that I have given you, my peace that I have instilled in you. Keep that. Keep that. Do not let it go so you can handle these trying times. Paul, in writing to the Colossians, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So again, Paul is pausing in a letter to another first century church, and he's giving them instruction about allowing the peace of Christ to rule in their hearts. Why? Because for many of us, maybe for many of us who are right here this morning, New Testament Christians have been bathed in the blood of the Lord Jesus, we still at times struggle with the peace of the Lord not ruling in our hearts. And it may be for, for many of us, we put that peace to the side or we put it on the back burner or we just move it out entirely and we let worry and anxiety move in. And so over and over again, we get these instructions, we have these reminders, we have these admonitions. Why? Because the tendency for so many of us is to do the opposite. The Hebrew writer in chapter 13, verses 5 and 6 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. That's a whole different topic for another day. But discontentment fuels and feeds worry and anxiety. It's one of the contributing factors, not the only one, but it is one. And so we need to be content with such things as we have because what is the tendency, what is the inclination? Oftentimes, do we struggle, if we're honest with ourselves, do we struggle with discontentment? Do, do we struggle with a desire for wanting things that we do not have? An unhealthy desire at times for wanting things that we do not have? For being focused on the things of this life? Then he says, concerning our Savior, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's what he's told us. 
And then he goes and he quotes the psalmist, so that we may, isn't it interesting, so that we may, now we have the capability, we have the capacity to make this following statement, the statement that the psalmist made, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We have the capacity, the capability to do that. But do we always do that? It's interesting that it says that we may, but it does not say that, that you always will because there are times that we won't because we're human beings and we struggle. And I think when we have the characters of the Bible revealed to us, we realize that this is not anything new that we're talking about this morning. This tendency to worry, this tendency to allow anxiety to have too prominent of a place in our heart and our mind and in our thoughts and our day-to-day lives. We see it over and over again by some of the greatest who have ever lived in Scripture. The passage that Cameron read for us a moment ago, that was the psalmist crying out. Did you let those words kind of sink in as Cameron was reading those for us this morning? He was talking about a man, a man of faith, who is not sleeping, who no longer feels the presence of the Lord's mercy. He no longer feels the presence of the Lord at all. And so here's a person of faith who is crying out, Lord, I'm crying out to you because I don't have peace right now. I have anguish. I have turmoil in my heart and in my soul. We see that over and over again, particularly in the Psalms. We see it come out. So it's a it's an issue, it's a real issue that so many struggle with. As I was continuing to think about this topic through the week, I think the title, if you've got a bulletin, is dealing with anxiety and depression. And we're, we're going to focus primarily on worry and anxiety. Depression is a different, a different matter in a way. In that, as, as um, psychologists have continued to study, there are, there are some... Um, factors, additional factors, in addition to what we're going to talk about this morning, that that can compound or contribute to depression. There are physiological, um, chemical, biological things that sometimes contribute. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to downplay that. I don't really want to try to even deal with that this morning. There's some of the, I'm thinking about one, um, one Christian lady in particular who Uh, If I was to name her name this morning, uh, some of you would know her as bubbly of a person. If you've ever met her in person, just she just exudes uh, the love of Christ in in her in her demeanor, in um, her words. It just just a a wonderfully pleasant person to be around. But um, she she has mentioned this uh, publicly. She at times struggles with debilitating depression. I mean, where literally she cannot function. And it's not because her prayer life has grown cold. It's not because her faith has grown cold. It's not because um, she's not been living the kind of life that the Lord wants her to live. It, there's, there's nothing, there's no separation from God because we know as Christians, when we separate ourselves from God, that can be a contributing, can be a contributing, it's not always, but it can be a contributing factor to worry and anxiety and, and depression. But with this, with this woman, it, it is a is a diagnosed medical situation. Um, and so that's kind of a different, so we're gonna focus this morning on, on worry and anxiety. And, and if we allow these things to fester, if we allow these things to grow, that they can lead to depression. That, that is not um, anything that is uh, biological or chemical. It, it, it's something that, uh, that is um, self-induced. But th- anyway, that's kind of a, a different topic for a different time. And some of us, many of us, may never, whether it's due to to any kind of a chemical imbalance or due to um, where we've allowed emotions to to fester and grow and stew to the point, we may never get to the point where we experience depression. But I believe all of us, every single person who has ever lived, I would dare say, has struggled with worry and anxiety at times. And it's an issue that that affects us all. Some of the greatest characters in the Bible, as we've mentioned, you know, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, those two sisters and brother, were dear to the Lord, um, spent uh, 
some intimate times with them is revealed to us in Scripture. And this is one occasion when um, the Lord is at their house, and, and you remember it well. Mary is at the foot of the Lord, learning from Him, drawing from His peace, from His strength, from His knowledge, from His wisdom. And Martha is concerning herself with the meal that they're going to enjoy together in a little while. And Martha comes in and gets on to, uh, well, asks the Lord to get on to her sister. It says, get her to come in the kitchen and help me with it, this meal. And you remember what the Lord said to her, Martha, you're, you're worried about many things. And, and he tries to encourage her, Martha, you're worried about things you just don't need to be worried about. The Lord, I'm sure, had made it abundantly clear, both his disciples and everybody that knew him, he was always more interested in the spiritual than the physical. The Lord was not one who walked around saying, man, when are we going to get something to eat? You know, when he got hungry, he might bring it up, but it just was not on the forefront of his mind while he was in the flesh. The forefront of his mind was on spiritual things, and I'm sure he had modeled that before, and I'm sure he had modeled it to Mary and Martha that he was not going to be complaining if the meal wasn't ready exactly when they had told him it would be ready when they invited him to eat. That wasn't Jesus' nature. And so I'm sure he has modeled that, and, and Mary is doing what Jesus referred to as the good part. She's chosen the good thing. She has chosen to forget about externals, forget about physical needs, and she's focusing on the spiritual. And it will not be taken away from her. And so the Lord is trying to remind us. And so now I ask this morning, because I have a feeling I'm speaking directly to a lot of you as I'm speaking to myself this morning. What are you worried about? What are you anxious about? And I'm sure for some of you it's a long list. It's a lot of factors. You may be concerned about your family, your health, your finances, and the list goes on and on. What are you worried about? The list may be long, but here's another question. It's a question that the Lord asked on one occasion. Why? All right, it's easy for us to identify the what. We can name that off pretty quickly. But then we might have to pause and think for a second. Don't we all just need to be like that squirrel? I mean, that's, that's living the good life right there, isn't it, Bryce? On another occasion in Luke chapter 12, the Lord repeats a lot of what he said to the multitude in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. And he's having this conversation with his disciples. Uh, he says a lot of the same things to them, admonishing them not to be warriors, not to be people who are anxious. And he says to them, who have you about worrying can add a single hour to his life? And he says, since you can't do this very little thing, since, since you cannot accomplish this one little thing, then why? The question is why? The Lord is, is asking them to reflect on why are you worried about all the rest. And so the Lord wants us to go through that exercise. It's, it's not just what we worry about. That's a pretty easy question to answer usually, but why do we worry? Maybe you've seen this, this little diagram or something like it before. And it makes a really good point. And it's the point that the Lord makes for us oftentimes in Scripture. Do you have a problem in your life? Ask yourself that question. If you're one of the few this morning who can say no, then of course the answer is then why worry? If you do have a problem in your life, your answer is yes. The next question is, can you do something about it? If your answer to that is yes, then why are you worried about it? If you have a problem in your life, ask yourself the question, can you do anything about it? And then if the answer is no, I cannot, then the, then the result is the same. Well, then why are you worried about it? If you can do something about it, why worry? If you can't do something about it, why worry? And so the Lord is asking us to reflect on not just the what, but the why that robs us of the peace of Jesus Christ that he wants to be the ruler in our heart and our mind. We kind of get farther. Boy, it's easy for us to answer that question, what? Man, it... it creates a little bit of thought when we start asking that question why? I, I want to talk for a moment and I know you know this but it's, it's worth us um, 
reminding ourselves, Philippians 4.13 is one of the most misused passages in all of the Bible. I did a quick Google image search of Philippians 4.13. Here's one of the first things that came up. Some dude hanging one-handed off a rock. That is not what Philippians 4.13 is talking about. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is not telling us that we can be a great rock climber. Here's a few more that came up. It's not telling us that we can lift 10,000 pounds. It's not telling us that we can bike up a steep mountain. It's not telling us that we can win an Olympic race. It's not telling us that we can beat Chuck Norris in a chess game. That's not what Philippians 4.13 is talking about. We all know we can't beat Chuck Norris in chess, okay? It's amazing the misuse of this passage. And this passage, I think, becomes even more powerful and pertinent and applicable to our life when we see the context in which that statement is provided. Paul is not talking about physical accomplishments. He's just not talking about that. And I'm thankful that he's not because I would have asked myself as I was growing up, Lord, I don't understand why, why I still can't hit a baseball 500 feet. You told me I could do all things through you who gives me strength. I'm not understanding. I can't understand why you're not allowing me to throw this baseball 95 miles an hour. You told me I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what he's talking about. In fact, the context, the build up to verse 13, there is not one thing mentioned in the first 12 verses about the physical. There's not one thing mentioned about physical strength, about physical endurance, about anything that is of a physical nature. Now, before we get into the context and spend a couple of moments there, let's, let's do a little bit of myth busting, and it'll help us understand and appreciate Philippians 4.13 a little bit better. The truth is we cannot do everything. Society, you know, tells us you can be whatever you want to be, you can do whatever you want to do. We don't need to fool ourselves into thinking that's right. The Lord gave us varying skill sets to make us, as a body of believers or as a human race, we complement one another. We fill in one another's gaps. There are things that, uh, that, that I'm not good at that you are good at. And there's things that, that I could try all day long and not do, but it may come naturally to you. And, and when we work together, we can't do everything physically speaking. I can wish all day to be 6'5". But what does the Lord say? Who of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? And so we can't do everything. And we need to stop fooling ourselves into thinking that we can. Here's another one. And uh, my wife told me to tread gently on this one because of how much it is believed, particularly by probably many of the women in our audience, we can't do multiple things at once. Let me just go ahead and we can't. We think we are at times. We think we may be capable of doing multiple things at once. Let me back this up with a statement from a psychologist who is a woman, okay? Nancy Napier says, much recent neuroscience research tells us that the brain doesn't really do tasks simultaneously as we thought or as we hoped. We're just switching tasks quickly. And we think we're doing a whole bunch of things at one time. But how many of you, when you're having a conversation with someone and then you look down to check whatever it was that made your phone vibrator beep and you look down at that phone how many are you how many of you are capable of being 100 percent engaged in the conversation that you're having and taking in the information that you're now looking at on your phone how many of you are doing both of those things at the same time please don't raise your hand because you're not you're not they have proved this over and over again. We can do one thing at a time. That's what the brain is capable of doing. Now, it's amazing how quickly some of you have developed the ability to switch from one thing to another. It's almost like you're doing it simultaneously, you think, because of how fast you can switch from one to another. But those who have studied this say that those who are trying to do multiple things at once, you're trying to have a conversation, check your phone, think about the kids, all these things that you're trying to do at one time. 
what you're doing is, is you're creating, and it might just be a nanosecond, but you're creating a little space of time in between switching your conscious mind from one task to another. So you're creating a little bit of time, even though it could be minute, but of course adds up over time. You're creating um, th this space of time where your mind is switching from being completely focused on one task to be completely focused on another, you are also are increasing the margin for error, the ability to mess up, the ability to make mistakes, and you are, you are hurting your proficiency. They say that with all the modern advances that we have, the benefits and advantages that we have through a scientific, technological standpoint in this life. People who have studied happiness, they say that people are as unhappy as they have ever been, maybe even more so. And it may be that there are some of us, we're trying to do so much, and we're trying to balance so many things, and whether consciously or subconsciously, we realize instead of doing a whole bunch of things at the same time well, what we're doing is we're attempting to do a whole bunch of things at the same time and we're doing them poorly. And what happens when we're not feeling as proficient, we're, we're not feeling as mistake free, we're not feeling like we're utilizing our time as well as we could, what happens? You know what that then leads to? Worry, anxiety. And so I think some of, uh, of the contributing factors to an off-the-charts level of worry and anxiety in the world today is we're trying to do too many things at one time and not focusing on what is most important. Brother Cliff in the 8.30 class this morning was talking about the fact that at times we don't utilize the power and the benefit of prayer the way that we should. And I've heard some people say, I'm so busy that the only time I can pray is when I'm driving in my car or on the way to my next place I've got to be and that's okay but if that's the only time we're praying we're not doing it right and I remember what brother Cliff said in that statement he made and it was very beneficial and words of wisdom was get off to a place by yourself and block out everything else don't try to multitask I mean, it's one thing to try to multitask uh, with you know your kids and preparing a meal or, or different things Man, let, let's not try to multitask when we're praying to God. Because the fact of the matter is, I've tried to pray when I'm driving before. And I have found myself, the, the majority of the time, forgetting that I was praying because I've been distracted by the other thing that I'm trying to do at the same time. Then I come back to the prayer, and it, the whole thing's just sloppy. And so it may be that, that we need to tr stop trying to think, I can do it all, I need to be doing it all, and we need to stop trying to think, and I need to do it all at once. And let's realize that our brain is not wired to work that way. Now, what is Philippians 4.13 talking about? We've um, discussed what it's not talking about. What is it talking about? Well, just look at the immediate context. Chapter 4 and verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. Verse 6, as we mentioned just a few moments ago, be anxious for nothing. Verse 8, the passage that Rob helped us recite this morning, that list of things that we are to meditate on, those things that are true and lovely and of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, meditate on these things. In verse 9, the things that you've learned and heard and seen of me, these do. Verse 11, Paul says, I've learned contentment in any state. And the, he, he expands on that point in verse 12. He says, I've learned um, contentment. I've learned to abound uh, when I'm hungry, when I'm full. When, when I'm uh, enjoying a, a time of abundance, when I'm abounding, when I'm suffering need. And, and then it's on the heels of all those things that he gives that proclamation in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if the memes and the, the pictures that we see 
when we Google image Philippians 4.13 on the internet, it should be pictures of people who are rejoicing in the Lord. People who are uh, experiencing a spirit of contentment even when the externals around them are chaotic. Someone who is practicing the things that we read about in Scripture. Someone who is being gentle to someone else. Someone who is spending a a time in quiet meditation on things that are true and lovely and of good report. Praiseworthy, virtuous. Those, if we're going to uh, capture the the image of what's meant in Philippians 4.13, those are the memes that should be. Not pictures of mountain climbing and bike racing and race running and weightlifting. So how do we combat worry and anxiety? How do we deal with this? Believe you me, I don't have all the answers because I was telling Wendy this, this morning, this week, I've been struggling with it more than normal. For <laughs> uh, That's crazy. I've been trying to think about this topic and reflect on it and study it and let the Lord's words emanate in my mind and here I am kind of like the the one in Psalm 77 and then look with me real quick before we close our thoughts here this morning Psalm 102 if you want to turn with me there Psalm 102 very similar to Psalm 77 that Cameron read for us this morning if your um, translation uses subtitles I love the subtitle that's provided in the translation that I'm reading from. It says, A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Verse 1, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily, for my days are consumed like smoke. My bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. And it goes on and on, the psalmist does. I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating. I literally feel like I'm coming out of my skin. I feel like I want to be anywhere than in my own skin right now, dealing with what I'm having to deal with. The psalmist, a godly, inspired writer. So, Please, as we go through these next couple of things quickly, I'm not telling you, hey, this is what I have accomplished. Now just follow my lead. (laughs) I'm preaching to myself as we go through these quickly. Analyze. Again, ask the question, why? What is the situation that's causing you to worry? Ask yourself what worrying is doing to help with the situation. You know what answer we always come up with when we ask ourselves that question? The answer is universally the same absolutely nothing that is what we're accomplishing when we worry zippo zero when you get done worrying about a matter that and a quarter will get you a gumball maybe out of a gumball machine I don't know with inflation you might not even get the gumball and the worry sure not going to make up the difference prayer Brother Cliff reminded us about in 830, as the psalmist remind us about over and over again, you know what the psalmist often are doing? They are revealing to us their current condition, and they're telling us what they decided to do about it. I'm going to send an SOS to the Lord. I am going to fall before his throne. I'm going to beseech his holy name. I am going to pray about it before Paul ever got to that great statement of verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Before he got there, he said one of the things that's going to help you get there, one of the things that's going to help you with contentment, with peace of mind, with the ability to meditate on those things that are most important, in order to meditate on what's most important, we have to deprive our mind of meditating on the worrisome things that maybe it wants to meditate on, which is in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Utilize that blessing of empowering God to intervene in our heart and in our mind then take action you remember that little diagram we looked at a few moments ago ask yourself why you're worrying and ask yourself the question can you do something about it if the answer is yes then get with it 
if you know what the solution is to something that you're worrying about, what does worrying about it and postponing the action plan that you know is needed, what benefit does the postponement of the action do? It does nothing but prolong and compound the problem. When we procrastinate, when we say, okay, I, I do know what I need to do, but I just need to spend a little bit more time worrying about it first, it only makes the situation worse. Number four, acceptance. There are times. Remember in that diagram, what are you worried about? The next question, can you do something about it? If the answer is no, I can't do anything about it. It is out of my control. Then it it's a difficult step, but at times it involves acceptance. That's what Paul realized in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, when he beseeched the Lord three times, Lord, please remove this thorn in the flesh from me. And it finally got through to Paul that the Lord was not going to do that. And he said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Strength is made perfect through weakness. And so you need to rejoice as Paul learned to do in his infir infirmities because it gave him that constant acknowledgement of his dependence upon the Lord and sometimes it's a hard step and I'm sure Paul had difficulty coming to that point man he's the Lord's really not going to do anything about this he's not going to take this away from me and when Paul accepted it then he was able to cope and move on and realize no sense in worrying about it now the Lord's given me the ability to handle it. He's given me the grace to deal with it. Let me rejoice in that. Let me rejoice in the fact that what I wanted gone is not gone, but what's in its place is the ability, the coping mechanism, the strength to get through it. Number five, serve. Look for opportunities to think outside of yourself. Looking outward provides less opportunity to focus on personal issues. We find ourselves by losing ourselves. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's what Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, 24 through 26. And it's not just prayer, but it's that when we've prayed, when we've prayed earnestly, it's that peace of mind that comes with complete and total trust. What changed between 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 10 and 18? We read in verse 10 that Hannah was in bitterness of soul and she wept in anguish. In verse 18, she went her way and ate. Her face was no longer sad. What happened? What happened in between? Hannah prayed earnestly. She prayed fervently. And Eli, after wrongly diagnosing and assessing her situation, then realizing what she was doing, said, the Lord's heard your prayer. And Hannah turned it over. She turned it over. Said, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. She prayed, and then she chose to trust the last thought I want to share with you this morning or reminder of two of those statements in the verses leading up to chapter 4 and verse 13 the peace of God in verse 7 which surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus you know what I picture when I read a statement like that if we allow the Lord to work in our heart and mind as he's capable of, as he's willing to, and as he wants to, then he stands as a sentry at the door of our mind. And when worry comes bebopping up, like it has so many times before, hey, um, I know them, they let me in all the time. Um, if you can just step aside, and uh, I hang out here all the time. And if the Lord's the sentry at the door, he's saying that I'm going to guard your heart and mind if you trust in me, and when worry comes bebopping up like it has so many times before, I'm going to say, worry, you hit the road. I'm guarding the door now. You don't get past me to that person that you've messed with so many times before. When anxiety comes bebopping up, hey, I'm, I'm worries, brother. 
and uh, I hang out here all the time. I basically live inside this person. I mean, this is my home away from home. Let me, Lord's sentry at the door. I'm guarding this person's heart and mind now. They were trying to deal with you by themselves. They realized that didn't go very far. Now I'm in charge. You can head on down and talk to somebody else. When we put into practice those things that God has instructed for us and we let go of what we have that tendency and inclination to do and we do the things that God has told us to do that are for our benefit, verse 9, whatever you've learned, received, heard from me, put into practice, now, now you are, you are act, activating your mind and your heart and your hands to do the will of God. And now the peace, the peace of God is with you. And now anxiety and worry, they just, they just don't get invited in near as much as they used to. Do they always go away? I wish I could say, yeah, they'll never come back. But what do we do sometimes? We lose sight. We lose sight of those things that are most important. If you're not a child of God this morning, then what a tragedy it is that you have been trying to live your life up to this point all on your own. You've not had the opportunity to enjoy the peace that passes all understanding because you've not yet allowed him to be the ruler of your life. By faith this morning, you can repent of your sins, confess Jesus Christ as Lord, be baptized into Christ, have your sins washed away, become a new creation. Allow your heart and your mind to have a sign hanging on the door saying, under new management, under new ownership, and life will be brand new. If at one point in time in your life you did that, you hung that shingle on the door of your heart and your soul under new management, new ownership, but for some reason or another you've gone out there and you've taken that sign off and you've replaced it with the sign bearing your name. It's time for you to get your priorities back in order. Let's pray with and for you. If we can encourage you in any way, let's do so right now.